Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff Mo Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. Today it is time for another female first, which means we are once again joined by our friend and coworker Eves. Hello, Eves. Hello. Yay, we're Eves. What's up? What's up? Hmm. What's up? We just had a very rousing conversation about urban legends, <laughs> the movie, uh, yes. and yes. now I yes, the movie, and now I'm very, very <laughs> determined to see it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it took Eves to convince you because when you I was must. saying it, I was like, uh, it's bad. Yeah. But yeah, and I actually think I said, uh, you might, you can do without it. I think that's yeah, what I said. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, see? I think the, the, it was a fair point about it being like, a, a, they tried to be Scream, but it didn't yeah, work out well. Yeah, the off-brand Scream. But when I was watching it, I was also thinking that it was a very, very, very... Uh, an inspiring version of Seven just because of the theme of oh. urban. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't the the, to- the topic, yeah. the the plot or anything like that. Just, right. just the basis of like having the killer be a person who followed this very specific um, mm. thing that was urban legends. And I think that's fun already because urban legends are like uh, just like a fascinating thing. That yeah. I mean, because they are urban legends, that's what they are. They're meant to spread, and nobody knows whether <laughs> they happen or not. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a fun time. Like I would recommend watching it once and never again. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's yeah, such a specific review. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say the the female lead in that one. She's actually in Supernatural. She's oh, she? the uh, woman who avenges her daughter. Oh. Uh, I mean, that kills could off describe the many. <laughs> kills many off all things. the angels. Try to avenge yeah. your daughter. It's her. And I, and I couldn't remember where I knew her from. This is my thing, Eve. Mm, I yeah. connect people no. from different movies to different shows. I love that. Yeah. I did that. I did that with, I did that with like three people in that movie. I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, that person looks so familiar, so familiar because <laughs> I'm already bad at, I'm really bad at remembering faces and, and right. putting faces with names. I can't, I'm not that great right. at remembering names. So. Mm-hmm. It is what Oh, it I'm is. the same way. Obviously, I don't know her name. I just know what she was in. I can tell you what other stuff she has been in. <laughs> yeah. That's about it. But yeah, I was doing that. I was like, that person is on that. Oh, and that person is on that. I d- but I was doing that again with Urban Legends because we said Noxima Girl. <laughs> yeah. That's my reference for uh, the, if you don't know, uh, the villain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. I knew it. I was about to say, like, I've never seen this movie, but I remember the cover and the description because I was just telling Eve there was like a point, a turning point in my life where I tried to buy Urban Legends when I was nine years old. My mom made me turn it back in. So I never got to see it. Um, And I remember thinking it was her, like, just from that brief, like, you know, I bet she did. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good laugh. It's a good laugh. It's not that scary, sir. If you're looking for an actual scare, there is some gory stuff, I guess, kind <laughs> right. of in there. But it's not truly scary. It's just mostly funny. I feel like those uh, are all those it. little slasher flicks, though. Yeah. They're really scary. They just kind of, they chase each other. Yeah, pretty much. Some of them, yeah, some of them can be pretty scary, but I, I love this. I feel like Sminty Reviews, horror <laughs> movies, bad horror movies should be a new segment. Definitely. <laughs> I am here all for right. that. I was going to say, and Eves will be a part of that as well. So, come on. (laughs) Every female first from now on starts with a a (laughs) mini-review of a bad horror movie. Uh, But yes, we are here to talk about uh, female first. Who did you bring for us today, Eve? Today, we're talking about Kono Yasui. So, Kono Yasui is the first Japanese woman to earn a doctorate in science. Um, so that is also like, as we always put disclaimers at the top of it, um, something that is like the history of education and women's education in in Japan is very long and detailed. And of course we won't be able to get into all of that today, but just like, I think there are a lot of firsts that I've come across that are kind of like the first person to get a PhD and the first person to get a doctorate in this thing, or the first person to get a bachelor's degree. And obviously a lot of that is centered around Western education. And a lot of these things happen after Western education evolved in Eastern countries. And this is one of those cases when, as a lot of sources will put it, um, Japan was quote unquote modernizing. I don't technically like, I don't really like that phrasing, but just Mm -hmm. as, you know, Western um, education was coming to Japan, um, this is one of those cases as well. And so Kono Yasui was the first woman to earn a doctorate in science and she put in a lot of work. Um, She wrote a lot of papers and she did a lot of research. And 
Um, there were other people who had gotten bachelor's degrees, and there were people after her um, to continue to get doctorate degrees in science. But there were barriers. There were cultural changes happening at the time. And that's the story. Yeah, that's that's the story that we're going to get into today. Yes. And, you know, one of my favorite things about this story is, and I mean this as the highest compliment, I truly do, but I love when people specialize in things that are so specific yeah. that you've never really thought about. Uh-huh. And like, oh, I'm writing a 80-page essay on the mold that grows on a turtle shell <laughs> if you leave it in a cave yeah. for 90 days or whatever. I'm like, this mm-hmm. is the best. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad that someone is passionate about this. I mean, with her stuff, she discovered so many things, so go ahead. Yeah. But yeah, it definitely reminded me of coming into science class and talking about photosynthesis. And I'm like, what? What's what's happening? Who did who did this? What? <laughs> I was thinking back to all of those times um, in the past where they would have science fairs in school, and you would have the little yeah. trifold boards, yes. and you would try to yes. create your own experiment. And I remember kind of being, I don't know if forced is the right word, but like really <laughs> feeling obligated to do those science fairs, even though science wasn't a thing that I really, you know, was that into or cared that much about experimentation in. But I guess you know you're experimenting yourself when you're. In those years and trying different topics and and fields that you might want to go into, but all of that's to say too that I mean I don't I don't really understand what Kono Yasui was doing. Like right. <laughs> a lot of that, like that's all foreign to me. Right. Um, mm. So I, I mean, all of those research papers, all of that is a lot more detailed than I truly understand. Yeah. Uh, oh, no. You're telling me you're not going to explain <laughs> your theories not. about plants? <laughs> I have not. so many doctorate papers out there. You're not going to read them out and talk, like <laughs> dissect each one of the things? I am absolutely not. <laughs> you just had a. You just gave me a moment where I had a flashback to one of my science fairs <laughs> projects where I didn't know what to do. So, so my teacher gave me these pea shoot plants and I'll talk about radiation and UV lights. Oh. And I cannot remember to this day what it was, but I won. I won the hey. damn plant. And then the plants died. Oh. You're welcome. That's the whole story. I can't remember That's what it was. Like, I don't know what I did. I just remember they were like, this is a kit. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you won. That, you know that was a real roller coaster of emotion. You're, you're welcome. Because I still, <laughs> like, I just had a flashback of it too. I was like, what was that? Yeah. But this is what this reminds I, me of. See, I loved science and I loved science fairs and I was really competitive, but I, no joke, on more than one occasion would do two projects instead of one because I would get so enthusiastic and I would get disqualified. You and then it. one of them would win and they'd be like, if only you hadn't been disqualified, this would have been the winner. Like, I have so, memories. <laughs> so wait, you were DQ because you did two and put both of those things in a fair? Like, you couldn't mm-hmm. have more than one? Yeah, only Why one. Why is that? Well, I don't know. It's not fair. fair. Everybody else. You for excelling. Yeah, everyone else could have done two. I wasn't yeah. stopping him. That's you know absurd. <laughs> As a person who did win but barely did her own project, that's absurd. Oh wow! Oh wow! <laughs> I love that you're coming at me with this project you can't remember because you won. <laughs> All right. Anyway, before back this to... results to blows, let's get into let's get into the story here. Okay, so we'll take it all the way back to when Yasui was born, which was in 1880 in Sanbomatsu, which was a port town in Kagawa Prefecture. She was one of nine children, and she grew up in the Meiji era, which was the period in Japanese history from 1868 to 1912. And like I said earlier, this was a time where there was a lot of political, economic, and social change happening a lot of upheaval, a lot of reform was happening um, that was influenced by the West, and education was made compulsory, and the feudal system of government was abolished. And there were all of these big, major changes happening that was affecting the way that people were operating in their day-to-day lives, that was affecting the hierarchies that were in place, and was affecting the way that people were interacting with each other as well. And... Education was a big part of this in those changes. And from a young age, Kono Yasui herself was really interested in academic study, and her parents would encourage that as well. And early on, her father gave her this book called An Encouragement of Learning, which was a book by Yukichi Fukuzawa. And Fukuzawa was an influential thought leader at the time. He wrote a bunch of stuff. People followed his writings in 19th century Japan. And he wrote about things like education, like equality, and other social and political topics. 
And he was an advocate of reform, and he brought Western ideas to Japan. Um, he founded Keio University in Tokyo. And in the 1860s, he reorganized the, the school to really focus on Western studies. And so an encouragement of learning is this 17-volume series that in which he emphasized the importance of education and put in there some sort of rejections of the contemporary social hierarchies that were in place. And he also in it argued that education was key to gaining personal independence and international independence. So uh, very indicative of the thought patterns and the changes that were happening in the society at the time. And Yasui was also interested in Japanese and Chinese history. So she did well in school overall, but some of her favorite topics were math and science. In 1898, she enrolled at the Tokyo Women's Higher Normal School. That, that school changed names uh, a few times over the course of his existence, but she was a science major and she graduated in 1902 and began teaching at a girls' school. So a few years later, she became the only science research student um, when the new research department was established at the Women's Higher Normal School. And she was, this is this is when you start getting into stuff that I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not uh, well-versed in um, animal anatomy or, any, or biology or any of those things, but she was encouraged to study the Karp's Weberian apparatus. So the Weberian apparatus is a group of small bones that's in the fish that helps with its hearing. She published her findings in that first paper. <laughs> Annie, um, looking at watching you right now, you're like, yeah, that sounds about right. So thank you for that oh. nod of <laughs> approval. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I can I'm do that like, much. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I can't deny. I mean, if you tell me that's what it is, then I believe you, Eves. <laughs> Sounds right to me. <laughs> she published her findings in her first paper, Weber's Organ of Carpfish, in the Journal of Zoological Science in 1905. And that was the first paper by a woman scientist published in the journal. Once she completed that program in 1907, she became an assistant professor at the school. Um, but she didn't get a ton of support and research through that position. But as a motivated person, Yasui decided that she wanted to independently do her own research in plant cytology and embryology. And so this is when she started documenting that. And, and I, this is what, you know, you're talking about in terms of getting really specific here. Yeah. Like when you find a thing, you really drill down into it. I think that's pretty admirable. Like, because we don't yes. all find those things in our lifetime, I feel like. Or maybe we... We could have. We missed out on them. Um, yeah. But she definitely um, seems like the type of person, and from the things she said, to really have enjoyed the research she did and was proud that she found a lane that she could really hone in on. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it so much, legitimately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love my friends who work in the science field, and they're like, I'm working on this very specific thing that I don't <laughs> understand at all. And I'm like, wow, cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can I can totally I can see that like the amount of dedication that it takes and like oh. focus that it takes to find that thing, yeah, and yeah. then spend so much time on it, <laughs> yeah, and how it like consumes your life and yeah. you're thinking about it every day and almost nobody perhaps in your friend circle understands right. what you're talking about. <laughs> like I have oh I have a friend who she has been in her doctorate program for a biology thing and she's told me four times what it was. And kind of try to tell me what she's working on. And she's been working on it for the past like four or five years. And I'm like, I forgot what you just said. Can you repeat it to me again? Because I'm so confused about what is happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess that can happen in smaller ways with things that don't require so much detailed research where you're just like, whatever you're doing sounds really cool. Right. But I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm not going to understand it. I'm going to forget everything you told me. So so please, like, have patience with me as you have to re-explain things to me over and over. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the, the joys of, like, having so many different things to, to be able to do in this lifetime. Yeah. yeah. We have a little bit more for you listeners, but first we have a quick break for a word from our sponsor. back. Thank you, sponsor. 
So uh, she decided she wanted to do this independent research, and she began documenting the anatomy of the aquatic fern Salvinia natans, which is a really pretty I was uh, say, yeah. name. I feel like I feel like a lot of yeah the species names and, and genus names and stuff like that can be like roll off the tongue very poorly. But I feel like Salvinia natans. Yeah, Salvinia natans. Like it should be a. D and D character in my campaign. <laughs> there no. you go. An aquatic fern. <laughs> what you have done? <laughs> That's a gnome with ferns growing on it. I yeah. Like <laughs> well, in my head, it's a sparkly plant that heals something. So yeah, go oh, ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like kind All of like resident g- evil, like gillyweed uh-huh. or something. Right. Yeah. Gilly yeah. Weed. It's not as pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so in her research. Uh, her research on Savannah and the Tons was published in a Japanese journal. And for the next couple of years, she continued to study plant cytology and the fern. And she used a microtome to cut sections of tissue to view under a microscope, which is basically just an instrument to do that. And she, in 1911, she was published in the British journal, Annals of Botany, with her paper on the life history of Savannah and the Tons. It contained a bunch of those drawings of the cut sections that she did of the fern. And it was that publication marked the first time that a Japanese woman was published in a foreign science journal. Uh, The first Japanese woman to get a bachelor's degree was Sutematsu Yamakawa, who graduated from Vassar College in the U.S. in 1882. And there were several imperial universities in Japan And there were some women who attended them before World War II, but overall, there weren't that many women who who attended the imperial universities. And out of those, it was a small percentage who majored in science. And while teaching at the Tokyo Women's Higher Normal Schools, Yasui herself submitted a request to study overseas. So the Ministry of Education rejected her request. And it's been said that that was due to the belief that women would not find success in scientific fields. Um, But regardless, Kenjiro Fuji, who was a professor at the Tokyo Imperial University, advocated for her. And the ministry eventually approved her request, but with the condition that she add research of home economics to her course of study overseas. And apparently she also had to agree to not marry and devote her life to research. That's so weird. Yeah. Wow. It still goes on. Like that, that, um, we did an episode on sexism at Tokyo University, and there were stories of like having a calendar of when women could have children. Mm-hmm. Um, just so like you wouldn't be out more, too many people wouldn't be out at the same time. Um, hmm. but yeah, that's oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I saw, yeah. I saw one blurb saying that they did this because they, she did, they didn't want to have her ambition outshine her uh, maybe husband or other huh. men or something, like maybe so yeah. that they wouldn't compete. And I'm yeah. thinking, what? That, what? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, none of that makes sense to me. I can't yeah. correlate well, those two things. It's odd, too, that they're like, well, you know, at least according to to these suggestions that they would say, you have to take a home economics course, but never marry or have children. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> there's some kind of disconnect there. <laughs> yeah, there's a little me. cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And it also is, I think there's a disconnect too in just kind of wanting national, like, I don't know, like wanting a little glory <laughs> and right. like having this person who you can, you can see a little bit of potential in already, but not wanting mm-hmm. them to be the person who represented that excellence or, or glory or whatever you want to call that thing in, in terms of representing the work that she did and and that she was a Japanese woman. But hey, it wasn't right. my decision. Um <laughs> It wasn't? No, what? it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> shocker. <laughs> yeah, the Ministry of Education eventually did approve the request. Um, but yeah, so in 1914, she arrived in the U.S. and she continued to research cytology in the U.S. at the University of Chicago. And she had planned on studying in Germany, but this was around the time that World War I broke out. So those plans kind of went by the wayside. And instead, she went to Radcliffe College in Cambridge, where she studied plant tissue under Professor Edward C. Jeffrey. So Jeffrey had developed a method for cutting thin slices from hard materials like coal. She kind of followed his that route, and he encouraged her to do research on coal, and she pursued those studies. And in 1916, she went back to Japan, and she began teaching at the Women's Higher Normal School and continued her research at Tokyo Imperial University. 
And at the university, she also oversaw the experiments that students were doing for a genetics course. And she herself went around Japan collecting coal. Um, There are accounts of her going down into coal pits herself with a basket to be able to collect the coal. And at the same time, she was still doing cytology and genetics research on plants and, yeah, digging deeper into that research. So over the course of that, she classified a bunch of plant fossils and discovered at least six ancient species of plants. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's the thing that you're like, I would love to be a part of something that you discovered something. You made these findings and you're attached to, I was so dedicated to something (laughs) that I found something new that you didn't know, which is a whole Mm -hmm. other thing. But yeah, that was so cool to read about that. And also like just how she kind of uh, transformed uh, and and made changes for about coal and stuff. You're like, whoa, that's Mm a huge proponent to, uh, you know, our resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to I think to also to have things named after you, which yes, we did, is really cool. Like, yeah. I don't know, mm-hmm. I see that. But she she published her doctoral thesis in 1927 that was called Studies on the Structure of Lignite, Brown Coal, and Bituminous Coal in Japan. It was a collection of nine papers, and she earned her doctoral degree from in science from the Tokyo Imperial University. Right. Was this their backtracking and being like, oh, of course we've always encouraged her to be a, a scientist. We knew she was going to be a genius. So look at this. <laughs> look how cool we are. Yeah, she, mm-hmm. she earned it. <laughs> <laughs> so that made her the first Japanese woman to earn a doctorate in science. And she, yeah, she, she helped elucidate the carbonization process by which plants turn into coal. We do have some more for you listeners. But first, we have one more quick break for a word from our sponsor. And we're back. So, yeah, she did a lot of research papers and had a lot of influence in that field. She was also involved in editing, accounting, and production at the journal Cytologia. And after the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, she researched plants that were exposed to radioactive material. And after World War II, she also advocated for the establishment of a national research university for women. She and Chika Kuroda, who was the first woman in Japan to earn a bachelor of science and the second woman to earn a doctorate in science, they established a scholarship to support women who worked in the natural sciences. But at the same time, Yasui is kind of described as not being a fan of putting women's work in a category of its own. Because in her view, that would just reinforce the inequality and it would mean that their work was not being held to the same standard. And that's not really how she wanted, in her in her view, and her purview, um, things to work and the people that she was teaching to think about their work. And she also valued the longevity of her work over recognition. So she wasn't that hot on the fame. She wasn't that hot on... She, well, I guess it wasn't the most important thing to her to be recognized for the work that she was doing. But even so, she definitely had an impact. And in 1949, the Tokyo Women's Higher Normal School became Otonomizo University. And Yasui became a professor of science at the university. But not long after, around 1952, she retired and she became a professor emeritus at the university. But even so, she continued her research and her editing for the journal. And over the course of her life, she published more than 90 papers, with the last appearing in 1957. So, yeah, uh, very prolific in terms of the work that she did. Yeah, 90 papers. Yeah. And it lasted. Like, wow, she's still like a lasting impact with her research. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So cool. I, I really do. I'm like, I got, I'm never going to look at ferns the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't wait to hear about your character, Salvini and the Times. Oh, <laughs> I'm already, I got the image in my head. 
it's she's gonna be like an enigma uh for sure oh, <laughs> of course she is <laughs> yeah i mean don't you feel like she would be an enigma i think so <laughs> <laughs> Got it all planned out, planning it out kind right now. Kind of one with nature. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She's definitely one with nature. Like that, that could not be anything else. Like she has to mm. be one with nature. She somehow controls some of it. Come on. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know the funny thing, I mean, actually sad thing, but uh, my D&D campaign is kind of about climate change and like the world coming into huh. an end. So she could be like a real, you know, <laughs> <laughs> emotionally tied to the planet and what it's suffering and yeah yeah, yeah. you got it all planned <laughs> out maybe you should you know read that research paper and get some <laughs> right get, get some, some background <laughs> some background yeah to for a little bit more inspiration I feel um, like I totally will but it's one of those things where I'm gonna have to read every sentence like I'll have to look up definitions for like every other word you know what I mean yeah those papers are so yeah Draining to read, but right. worthwhile if yeah. you put in the time. <laughs> well, I was going to say, as you're like explaining the things she's done and, and how she's getting there, what she's accomplished, I had to sit back and through with like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. And then comment, the pause is us trying to yeah. take everything in that she's doing or the experiments she is trying to do or all of that. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, cool, mm-hmm. cool, yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, different, definitely different life path. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> One worth, you know, studying and looking back on. Nonetheless, she did get a lot of honors for the work that she did. Um, she received the medal with the purple ribbon, which was a medal that is awarded to people who have made outstanding academic and artistic achievements. And she also received the Order of the Precious Crown, third class, which is a Japanese order. And she died in 1971 at age 91. So um, she lived a, a pretty long life and one that she that was pretty full of her dedication to research and and traveling through that research as well. And mm-hmm. yeah, I think one that's good to look back on in terms of all the other people that came after her who who studied science and not just because they got a doctorate in it, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, of course, that's her first and, and that's the thing that is a notable achievement and accomplishment in her lifetime. But like when it comes down to it, like what mattered and what got her there was the work that she did and her dedication to it. And that is what she was so consumed with in a seemingly healthy way and one that uh, helped contribute to the entire field of science uh, all throughout the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's it's really worthwhile to talk about this because this kind of stuff is still going on of like women in science. It's still a big conversation and the barriers and obstacles they're in and, and getting more women involved in science. I know I've told the story multiple times of when I was in high school, my favorite subject was physics. And then I was told like, it's not cool for girls to like math and science. So mm-hmm. I changed my path. Um, and then and right now with COVID and the pandemic, we're seeing those studies come out of how many women are being penalized Like their papers aren't getting submitted or read um, because of all of the things that they're having to do um, with children or or other jobs or being caretakers in general. So I think this is a good, um, this is a good first to talk about um, and still ongoing conversation we're having. Right. And I also think like one of the things that you were talking about how she didn't want to have just the one women's categories because it was such a binding category and how it can limit women in itself. Like the fact that we haven't even gotten past that. Like we still have to categorize in order to be able to equalize the playing field because people are so willing to dismiss those, uh, dismiss women in general in the field. And unless we have categories like that, they're not allowed to give, they're not even given a chance. So the fact that from, you know, her time to, to this time and that hasn't changed it's really yeah. sad <laughs> <laughs> yeah i say laughing there <laughs> there are still so many fields though that have that that create that distinction and i think there have been calls mm-hmm. over the last couple of years like when it came to what the academy awards i think yeah. like having having gender separations there um like when it comes to musicians um in terms of like oh like women hip-hop artists or women rappers have to be in this category and they can't be compared to, or they can't be put in the same 
the same field or they don't necessarily deserve to be, you know, put in the same categories as these men. I think that always, even if we say it's just because of gender, like there's always the background where it's because we still hold the assumptions around them not being as good lyricists or MCs as. Mm -hmm. So just so many... So yeah, so many different places, and I, and I think that um, th- I think that we can always have a debate about that because there are going to be people who understand that, and then but then there's also the side of it, like well, we were so marginalized for so long that it's necessary for us to uplift women in a certain way um, to be able to you know, kind of do course correction in terms of that. So it's like, okay, we need this women's category because it was so long we were left out. And this this is the the easiest way for us to 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 get that sort of highlighting. But um yeah, it's it's definitely a right. thing that continues in science and and in so many other fields. Yeah. Oh. I, I have to say like when people find out I'm on a feminist podcast, it's surprising how many times it's like one of the first questions they ask me is like, what do you think about the Academy Awards? Should there be two categories? That's the first question? <laughs> I get that yeah, a lot. That's I, I haven't yeah, had no. that question yet. That is surprising. Oh, well, I think it's because I'm also an actor. Like, oh. you know, okay. there's that intersection of it. But it, yeah. It, yeah, it is funny to me how many people have asked me that. Yeah. I'm like, oh, huh, okay. And I, yeah, I can definitely understand the frustrations when we had um, Esther Cho. That's one of the things that she talked about being really frustrated that she has to be qualified as being the best fem- female chef or be, you know, mm-hmm. in these categories instead of just being like, why can't I just be a good chef? And yeah. like, yeah, that would be ideal. And I know that's some of the arguments of like women don't need their own categories or, you know, people of color don't need their own categories. But the issue is, is the marginalization slash erasure of people who are doing these good works, as well as the fact that a lot of times people doing these good works get their ideals stolen from them Mm -hmm. and then credited to white people or Mm -hmm. people that are not of that marginalized community. And that's part of like why like the back and forth is like, yeah, I get it. This is not great. And we wish we didn't have to be separate this out. But at the same time, if we don't, you don't ever see and you don't ever talk about the underlying, hey, this is actually what happened. This is actually what, you know, it's the truth of it all. And you ignored it until we highlighted it. Like, it's right. just, it's so upsetting because you're like, it is this balance of mm-hmm. one or the other. And we are, we are trying to equalize the playing field. Yeah. Oh. And there were, and there, Annie. oh, sorry, Annie? No, I was just going to say heavy sigh, but. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which like this? Yeah, there is there is also uh, recently, I think over the past year, been news popping up about the, gender disparities in Tokyo University still. Mm -hmm. And so that's still a thing that happens in in so many, in in a lot of higher education around around the world still. Right. Yep. Oh. (laughs) Well, you know, we started at Urban Legends and we end on heavy size about gender disparity. That sounds about right. Right. Um, is there anything else you want to <laughs> add? That sounds Eves? about right. <laughs> <laughs> Very morbid, but no. Um, no, there is nothing else. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> is there Where can the good listeners find you? Um, you can find me on the internet. I'm at Eve's Jeffco on Twitter, at Not Apologizing on Instagram. You can also find me on the show's Unpopular, which is a show about people in history who really broke down barriers and were persecuted for the things that they did. And you can also find me on the show This Day in History class, which is about people in history who are, well, not just people in history. It's about people and history and events in history. Um, and those are short daily doses of new things and hopefully interesting things that you can learn about. <laughs> definitely interesting things. That's cool. what I'll say. <laughs> yes. And, and yeah, you, you definitely like, need to go see her uh, Instagram because she does some yeah. great stories. <laughs> yes. Her Instagram <laughs> is the best. <laughs> <laughs> And if you would like to contact us, you can. Our email is stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can also find us on Twitter at momstuffpodcast or on Instagram at stuff I never told you. Thanks as always to our super producer, Andrew Howard. Thanks, Andrew. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 